If you take a stone and put it inside a container with water, then you may already know that this water will start pushing on that stone in all directions, like this. And if you calculate this total force per unit area, how much force is acting per unit area, then we call this quantity, we call this quantity as pressure. Pressure. And in this video, we're gonna understand the effects of this pressure on materials. All right, so let's begin. Now, instead of a stone, if we imagine there was a balloon over here and it was being compressed in all directions, then I hope you'll agree with me that the balloon would just shrink in size. Well, guess what? Our stone will do something very similar. Because of this force in all directions, that stone is going to get compressed, it's gonna shrink in size. And of course, the shrinking is going to be very microscopic, and, it, and as a result of that, we can't see it with our naked eyes, but it'll be there. So, we could imagine that this stone shrinks in size like this as a result of this pressure. Now, of course, I've exaggerated over here. In reality, it'll be very tiny, but it's there. And now to resist this deformation, our material is going to generate, our material is going to generate a restoring force which will oppose this. So a restoring force will be produced in the opposite direction. And if you calculate this total restoring force per unit area, we'll call that as the bulk stress. So the quantity over here is bulk stress. And we've spoken about stress before in previous videos, and we always define stress as the restoring force, some kind of restoring force per unit area. And we've spoken about this stress a lot in previous videos, so if you need a refresher, it would be a great idea to go back and watch those videos first and then come back over here. But we always define stress as some restoring force per unit area, and if that restoring force acts in all the directions, all the directions, then we use the word bulk stress. Now when this stone is in equilibrium, the restoring force, the force from inside, must be the same as the force from the outside, right? Otherwise the material would never come in equilibrium. And so we could say in equilibrium that bulk stress must be equal to pressure. To pressure. And as a result of this pressure, notice the volume, the volume of this material has decreased. And so we are gonna define another quantity called as bulk strain, bulk strain. And again, as discussed before, strain is a quantity which is usually defined as some change in dimension per unit dimension. That's how we usually define strain. And so over here, since the volume is changing, we could call this as the change in volume per unit volume, per unit volume. And then naturally, if you increase this pressure more and more, then the stone will compress more and more, and as a result, the bulk strain would increase, and the bulk stress would keep increasing. So there must be a correlation between the bulk stress and the bulk strain, right? And that correlation is given by Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law says that the bulk stress, which is the same as pressure, is proportional to bulk strain. It's proportional to bulk strain. And we can now get rid of this proportionality and we'll say it's equal to, and we're gonna put a constant over here and that constant is the modulus of elasticity. And the modulus of elasticity over here is called as B, the bulk modulus. So we call this as bulk modulus. And notice since under pressure, the volume of the stone is decreasing, the delta V is a negative number because the final volume is smaller than the initial volume. And just to represent that, usually we'll put a negative sign over here, just telling us that the volume decreases when you put this stone under pressure. All right, let's talk a little bit more about this bulk modulus now. Let's start with its units. Now it's just like any strain, the bulk strain also is unitless, which means the modulus B must have the same units as pressure. And the units of pressure is newtons per meter square or pascals. So the bulk modulus also has the same units as pascals. The next thing is what does bulk modulus tell us? Well, if bulk modulus is very high, then notice for the same strain, a higher pressure is needed. In other words, higher the bulk modulus, more difficult it is or harder it is to compress that material. So if you look at some examples from say this table, 
We have some material over here and we have its bulk model I on the right hand side. Notice that steel has the very high bulk modulus compared to water and air, steel is being solid. We would expect solids to have high bulk modulus because it's very hard to compress them. On the other hand, notice liquid has a little bit lower bulk modulus, but still pretty high. Two gigapascals, giga is 10 to the power nine, is still pretty high, but not as high as solids. But notice air, which is a gas, has a very low bulk modulus, which means a much lower pressure is needed to compress air. Air is easily compressible. And this is also quite intuitive because if you take, for example, a plastic bottle which has just air inside it, no water, then it's very easy to crush that because air has a very low bulk modulus. So notice lower the bulk modulus, easier it is to compress something. And therefore, I hope you can see that the compressibility factor or how easy it is to compress something is actually inversely related to bulk modulus. And it's for that reason we actually define something called compressibility compressibility and the name itself tells you what it is it's a number that tells you how easy it is to compress something and we define that as the reciprocal of the bulk modulus and so from that from the compressibility point of view air has a high value of compressibility and steel for example has a low value of compressibility now one material that usually pops to my head when we talk about Bulk, bulk stress and compressing is sponge, right? I mean, think about it. Sponge, they are very easily compressible, and yet they are solids. I mean, think about that. Solids usually have a high bulk modulus or low compressibility, but sponge is an exception, right? I mean, it's a solid, and yet it can be easily compressed, so it has a very, very high compressibility. Why do you think that is? Well, it turns out that sponge has a lot of holes, so it has a lot of air pockets in between, and it's because air is highly compressible, this whole sponge ends up being highly compressible. So the reason for that is it has a lot of trapped air inside. 